This experimental design lecture is going to look at ethics in the context of two very famous and well-known experiments. Um, you shouldn't think of this as a comprehensive lecture that covers all the ethical concerns. It's just two what I think are particularly interesting and influential studies. So we're at the ethical protections and informed consent part here. This follows on from medical testing. The end of that lecture, I talk about the informed consent process. These experiments that I'm going to talk about here explain why we have that process. And again, this is for your coming exam, misuses of statistics, which is actually um, more relevant to this sort of thing. Um, but let's continue. Okay, the first experiment to discuss is the Tuskegee experiment, which occurred from 1932 onwards. Um, the original plan of the experiment was to recruit four African-American men from the South that had syphilis, which was a disease we didn't know much about the time. Remember, this is 1932. There's a lot we didn't know. The idea was to observe them for six to eight months and then give them either mercury or bismuth, both of which are toxic. But actually, back in those days, this was actually not a terrible idea because syphilis was a serious disease. This is pre-antibiotic, right? Antibiotics were discovered in World War II. This was actually you know, a legitimate scientific question, would these two things actually cure syphilis and be a net positive? So that was fine and good. And then the depression happened, right? So the Rosenwald Fund, which was a pro-black charity that was doing this experiment because they were trying to find a cure for a disease that particularly affected the African-American community, they ended up losing all their money in the depression. So there was really no money for the treatment. They couldn't afford the mercury or the bismuth but they had already recruited these people. So they changed the design to be a long-term observation study of syphilis progression, right? They'd already recruited a bunch of people. They might as well continue the study even though they could no longer afford the mercury or bismuth. I'm gonna point out this like red triangle down here is because the next slide I go to has some images that might be disturbing, uh, but here we go. All right, this is what syphilis looks like, 1932. We have about 400 men with syphilis begin the study and about 200 men without syphilis as controls. The effects of syphilis can be quite severe. It can cause open lesions on your skin. And in fact, this is a baby that caught syphilis um, from its mother who had syphilis. And um, you can see that it's experiencing um, fairly severe health problems there. All right, so 1932, we start off with roughly 600 people. In 1946, after World War II, penicillin was discovered, our first really good antibiotic, and it turns out that it might actually cure syphilis. So we have this group of 600 people. Penicillin is now a really good possibility to cure syphilis. So what is it that we're gonna do? So actually, instead of directly working with the people they already had, they decided to conduct a parallel experiment, right? So the question is, does penicillin work as a prevention as well as a cure for syphilis and gonorrhea, a similar disease? So the approach that was taken was to get a grant from the NIH, National Institutes of Health, in 1946. And their experiment was going to infect female sex workers and then pay them to have sex with study subjects to see whether penicillin protected the study subjects from getting syphilis or gonorrhea from these prostitutes. Of course, the problem is the Surgeon General of the United States decides that this is immoral in the United States. So if there's something that's immoral in the United States, what do you do? Of course, you go somewhere else, right? So the solution was to go to Guatemala, right? Central American country down here. And they did the experiment there. They infected some sex workers and paid them to have sex with some soldiers and some prisoners, individuals they had recruited to participate in the study. Although if you think about it, Soldiers generally have to follow the commands of their superiors and prisoners don't actually have a lot of freedom to say no to a lot of things. Anyway, then it turns out that there was actually a low infection rate. It turns out that the per event chance of getting syphilis or gonorrhea even from someone who's infected is pretty low. So they just switched to direct inoculation, right? Giving these people direct injections of the syphilis and gonorrhea to see whether the penicillin protected them. They did this to 1,500 subjects or victims, but the study ended up being abandoned because there started to be rumors about you know, what was going on in Guatemala, what is the National Institutes of Health doing down there. They were never published. In fact, they remained secret until 2005, 
when this reporter found this quote here, right? This is a quote um, by one of the people running the experiment, right? I'm a bit leery of the experiment with the insane people. So that's the prisoners who are mentally ill. They cannot give consent, do not know what is going on. If some goody organization got wind of the work, they would raise a lot of smoke. In other words, the people themselves doing this experiment knew that what they were doing is wrong, but they kept doing it anyway. Meanwhile, back in the US, as the government was experimenting at people in Guatemala, the members of the Tuskegee experiment were not given the penicillin, right? So that penicillin was being tested in Guatemala. And in fact, the study subjects in the Tuskegee experiment were actively prevented from receiving penicillin. The people running the experiment talked to local clinics and had them deliberately deny giving penicillin to the people in the study. And about 250 of the people in the study ended up getting drafted and the people running the study used their connections to make sure that those individuals did not get the usual penicillin and vaccinations that someone entering the army um, or armed services would typically get. So not only were these people kind of denied getting penicillin from the study um, practitioners, they actually, the study practitioners went out of their way to make sure they weren't getting penicillin from some other means. So this study, then from 1946, which is when penicillin is known to perhaps be effective, the study continues until 1972, when a newspaper article by another reporter exposes the study. And so by 1972, 28 of the original 399 individuals with syphilis had died from it. 100 of the 399 had died from complications related to syphilis. 40 of them had infected their wives and 19 kids were born with syphilis related birth defects. So think about what's happening here, right? 1932, the study starts and that's fine. They run out of money, there's no good treatment. So they switch it to a study that looks at people. 1946, penicillin is discovered and might be helpful, but instead of switching the study, instead of giving everybody penicillin to see if it works, they didn't. They just continued to watch these people until 1972, which is morally and ethically unacceptable. So what institutions were involved in the Tuskegee study? Like what horrible, evil organizations did this to these individuals? First up, it's named the Tuskegee study because it was done by the Tuskegee Institute, which is a historically black college in Alabama, still around. The United States Public Health Service was involved in doing some of the field work, still around. The Centers for Disease Control was involved in the Tuskegee experiment, still around. The National Medical Association, which is actually the medical association devoted for African-American doctors, right? Their charter to advance the art and science of medicine for people of African descent through education, advocacy, etc. The African-American, essentially medical association, still around. The American medical association was, was evolved, still around. And the National Institutes of Health, um, they provided money for this Guatemala grant, still around. So this absolutely unacceptable experiment, the Tuskegee experiment, that really demonstrated a total lack of any caring for these individuals whatsoever was performed by a bunch of institutions that are still in this country. So what's the aftermath of this, right? This reporter outed the whole experiment in 1972. In 1974, there was the National Research Act, which was passed, and that's when this informed consent was begun, right? because they looked and they realized that these men participating in the study, they were not given accurate information about what the risks were. They were not essentially given information, nor were they really asked for consent. They certainly weren't asked for consent to have their medical care denied from a bunch of other agencies. 1997, Clinton made a formal apology from the president. 1990, a survey of about a thousand African Americans in the South asking about HIV AIDS, right? That's a fairly new disease back in 1990. And about a third of those individuals said that AIDS was artificial, about a third of them said it was a form of genocide, and about 44% said the government's not telling the truth about AIDS. And on the one hand, that seems crazy, right? A bunch of African Americans in the South think that AIDS was an 
disease essentially invented by the US government to kill black people. But on the other hand, if you're aware of the Tuskegee experiment and you've seen what those government agencies did and how they treat black people, how is this even an unusual belief, right? It actually is consistent with the government actions. So why is this relevant for this course? Well, this lecture is about biases. This sort of history, this sort of attitude, these sorts of acts by the US government and its agencies is a big part of what contributes to low African-American rates of volunteering in medical studies. The community has been treated so poorly in the past that it makes them naturally and rightfully suspicious of some drug company that you know puts an ad up in their neighborhood or an ad on their radio or an ad on their web browser that says, oh, come join our you know medical experiment. We're looking for African-Americans like you. Well, if you're an African-American and you're aware of the Tuskegee experiment, why would you ever respond positively to that ad? Finally, there's an interesting note. So this experiment went from 1932 all the way to 1972. So that's a period of 40 years. And there was really only one individual who participated in the study from the very beginning to the very end. And it was, that was this woman, um, Miss Evers. So she was an African-American woman who was hired as a liaison to the African-American men that were participating in the study. And if you think about it, it's kind of amazing to think about the like, here's an African-American woman participating in the study that is essentially one of the worst things that this country has done since slavery to African-Americans in like a legal, governmentally approved manner. What would cause this woman to keep doing these things to these individuals. And that leads us to our second experiment. This experiment is called the Milgram experiment. And so this experiment was done in 1963. And here's the diagram of the experiment. Basically, you have an experimenter who's kind of supervising and running the study. And you have two people participating in the study. You've got a learner here who's got to memorize pairs of words like car, truck, apple, orange. And you've got a teacher who once that's occurred, they're gonna kind of be hooked up and the teacher's gonna say car and the learner's job is gonna be, oh, truck. And then the teacher's gonna say apple and the learner might say, oh, uh, pear and get it wrong. So if when this person asks the question, this person gives the correct answer, they move on to the next question. If this person, however, gives the incorrect answer, this person is supposed to press one of these buttons, which administers an electric shock to the learner um, to basically punish them for not having the right answer. And each time they get a wrong answer, the voltage increases by 15 volts. And if you think about it, this is a kind of interesting experiment does the threat of punishment by electrocution actually cause this person maybe to learn these word pairs better than if they weren't at risk? Now, obviously this can get unpleasant because after a while, if this person starts getting them wrong, this person is electrocuting somebody else and they might start to feel guilty and not want to continue. So if this person wants to stop the study, um, the experimenter, this person here, has four verbal prompts to give them to continue, right? So if this person says, oh, I, I'm not happy about this, I'd like to, to stop the study. This person would say, oh, you should really keep doing the study. And then the second time, oh, you really should keep doing the study. And the third time, I really think that the study should continue. And then the fourth time, oh, the study must continue. And then if this person objects a fifth time, then um, after four complaints, the fifth complaint would stop the study. And these shocks actually become painful and dangerous, especially because they're increasing by 15 volts, right? After a while, this person can hear this person screaming in pain. Sometimes they bang on the wall. Some of them have heart conditions that they start to complain about. And in fact, once you get to the really high voltage, sometimes the learners go completely silent. And in fact, silence is an incorrect answer, right? So car, silence. Oh, he didn't answer in time, you gotta shock him. Okay, press the button, shock, silence. Next question, apple, 
silence, etc. So here are the results from an experiment with 40 people. This is the first experiment. So some of these teachers paused at 135 volts. Note that that's after about like eight shocks and expressed concern. Only one of these 40 people stopped the experiment, right? Protested more than four times before they made it to 30 volts. That's 20 shocks. 26 of the 40 people went all the way to 450 volts. That's essentially 30 shocks of another human being causing pain because they get this question wrong. And none of the people who stopped early, right, the 14 people that stopped early, insisted that the overall experiment should end. They just didn't want to keep doing it themselves. And none of these people left the room to go and check on this person to see if they died, right, because they went silent sometimes, without asking this person for permission. Right? Which is weird. If you think about it, this person is the one who just kind of forced them into killing this person. But before you go and check to see if this person is alive, you're going to ask permission from this person. And a variety of similar studies actually ended up agreeing that about two thirds of all the people who got recruited to be teachers actually would go all the way to essentially killing this learner in this science experiment. So if you think about it, what that means is about two thirds of college students are potential murderers. And this is not a euphemism. This is not a joke. This is not an exaggeration. This is the actual results of this experiment. These people, electrocuting these people, two thirds of them essentially electrocuted them to the point where they could no longer respond. So um, turns out this experiment is a little different from how I've described it. So this person is doing the experiment. This person is the study subject. This person is actually an accomplice, right? This person is not genuinely being electrocuted. They are pretending to be electro electrocuted, right? So that's the study supervisor. That's an accomplice. This is the study subject. But this person did not know that this person was faking it, right? So this result, about two thirds of the people electrocuted to death, they certainly think that they are killing another person. So various versions of this experiment were run. So when you run the experiment with women, there's no difference. About two thirds of women are murderers too. The experiment was done at Yale. If you take the experiment off of the Yale campus and move it somewhere less prestigious or intimidating, the compliance rate goes down to about 50%. That's a non-significant decrease from 66%. If this experimenter is not in the room, if they're just calling in by telephone to talk to this person, the compliance rate goes all the way down to 20%. But note, that's still 20% of people murdering other people because they're being told to over the phone. And we can also see the effect of peer pressure. If the experiment adds more teachers, right? If there's two or three people here, and these are accomplices, right? So they're always willing to um, do the electrocutions, then this person's compliance rate goes up to 95%. But if these people always refuse and want to stop, this person's compliance goes down to 10%. So this is what peer pressure is, right? Peer pressure is not some sort of like cheesy one person asking you to do something and you're going to do it or not. It's you're in a group of people. And if that group of people refuses to kill someone, you'll probably refuse to. But if you're in a group of people and that group of people is fine with killing somebody, you'll probably kill someone too. And these are college students like you. This is not other people. This is United States American college students just like you. And all of these results relate back to this example of Miss Evers from the Tuskegee experiment. How could she have done what she did to the African American man that she worked with? Essentially because authority figures told her to, right? The other people that she was working with were all doing this experiment. It was fine. She was the person here. The educated men from the Tuskegee Institute, the US Public Health Service, everything, they were here. And the African American men were here. So we shouldn't demonize her or maybe even blame her. She was basically acting the exact same way the rest of us would in a similar situation.
Um, sometimes people wonder if you could tell if this was fake, so they also did a version where they hooked actual electrodes up to actual puppies, right? No faking. And people did the, still did the electricity, right? 54% of the 13 males went all the way to the end, 450 volts to the puppies, and all of the females participating shocked the puppies 30 times if they didn't do their, their trained task properly. All right, what's the impact of this um, experiment? So it turns out some of the participants were psychologically harmed, right? So even after they were told afterwards, no, 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 you weren't shocking that person, they still felt traumatized because they thought they had electrocuted someone to death um, because um, they were told to and the acting was good. So that's actually part of why this informed consent process is very concerned about both the physical and the mental harm to the study subjects. It's not just will the person have their blood taken and that's a problem, it's will that person undergo psychological harm from participating in the experiment. And then we can also think, why was this Milgram experiment performed and how does this link to um, the Tuskegee experiment just talked about? Well, the Milgram experiment was performed because in 1963, the country was coming out of the end of World War II and trying to figure out what had caused things to go so bad in World War II. The purpose of the experiment was to understand the degree to which people abandon their free will under authority, right? So in World War II, Germany went crazy. One guy gave a bunch of speeches and convinced millions of other people to go to war, to commit a Holocaust. And these were not monsters. These are completely ordinary, normal Germans, right? They were normal before the war. They did unspeakable things during the war and then they were normal after the war. So what was going on? Well, authority figures, people in lab coats, like the Milgram experiment, or people with confidence in uniforms and positions of political power, turns out if they tell people to do stuff, free will disappears really quickly for almost all people. This scene here is actually a, a, from a movie called The Reader which is actually a really interesting Nicole Kidman movie, you should see that's all about this issue. So the Milgram experiment was performed to see how easily people abandon their free will under authority, and the results were unequivocal. Authority figures, when they tell people to do things, most people will do what they're told, even up to and including murder by a majority of people. So these are pictures from Abu Ghraib. This is the prison that the US ran in Iraq. This is a woman called Lindsay England. Here she is with an Iraqi on a leash. Here she is posing with a dead body, a dead Iraqi prisoner. Here she is posing with another one. Here is her commanding officer also posing with the dead body. The commanding officer is also her boyfriend. So when these pictures came out of the media, she was vilified, right? She was held up as like this horrible, evil person, this unspeakable monster. But in fact, she was actually acting the same way as a bunch of other people, right? In that prison, the authority figures above them were told, were told them, you need to soften up these prisoners. You need to get information out of these people. And what did that do? That turned them into people who take selfies with dead bodies and drag other people around on leashes. This person is not a monster. This person is actually just an example of what almost everybody will end up doing if an authority figure tells them to do something. And we can look at other things. This is more recent news. This is ICE. Here's a secret Facebook group, a story about how this organization was sharing racist memes. The country is currently rounding up all these people, locking them up because authority figures are telling them to. These are people who maybe in their everyday life would be perfectly ordinary neighbors and good people. But if authority figures are telling them to do certain things, then they're just going to do that. That's part of our human nature. So why do I talk about this? I talk about this because many of you are going to go on to careers in the medical fields. And in those situations, you will be the authority figure. When you have a scared patient coming to you for help and advice, 
what you tell them is what they're going to do. You'll be the person in that white lab coat and they will essentially be at your mercy. And so that is an amount of power for which you need to feel responsible, right? So there's four different quotes on this slide. You can choose whether you believe in superheroes, US presidents, the Bible, or fantasy fiction to get your morals from, um, but you should think about it.